Hi, Shay Russell here from Fat Tail Media. And joining me today is none other than the commodities investing legend, Rick Rule. Rick, how are you today? Uh, the better for being on with you. Thank you. Look, I just want to say thank you very much again for joining me. I know um, Aussies will absolutely love your insights. Uh, and, you know, when I call you a commodities legend, there's a reason why I want to talk with you. And, you know, we've basically got all the commodities that the rest of the world wants. So having insight to movements in commodity prices and obviously broader macro trends is very important for Australian investors. Now, to kickstart our conversation today, I did make a promise about to myself earlier in the week that we wouldn't talk about gold. Uh, but then gold went and had the absolute stuffing kicked out of it on Tuesday and took gold stocks with it. In fact, it was just this slide into Hades on my screen. Tell me, what do we do about this volatility? Is it a buying opportunity or is this what investors need to just adjust with in this, you know, sort of new investing normal? Well, Shay, investors would be well advised to watch our last interview where we talked about the fact that uh, cyclical declines, uh, and for that matter, cyclical advances within a secular bull market are to be expected. Uh, the truth is that this is an extraordinarily volatile asset class. And what you will find uh, observing the anatomy of the two past bull markets is that uh, very rapid advances and declines uh, on the order of 10 to 15% can occur with the ease and frequency with which you and I breathe. Uh, the circumstance that we're going through is normal and natural. People like to ascribe uh, reasons or blame to it. It might be relief over the Biden victory or something like that. Something else might be COVID. Something else might be, I don't know, North Korea with a bomb. The truth is that uh, this sort of uh, violent volatility is part and parcel uh, of the gold market. And to the extent that you're going to participate in the market, particularly to the extent that you're gonna play the smaller end of the gold stock game, uh, assets that are volatile by their own nature. If you think about a volatile asset superimposed on a volatile asset, you get some sense of the turbulence that you're going to uh, experience in the junior market. Now, investors who don't, or speculators who don't have confidence in their position particularly hate volatility because the, their affirmation from the market prices of their asset. In my particular case, where uh, I have a 45 stock uh, focus list and a 15 stock buy list, uh, volatility could be extremely useful to me if I've already done the research on something, but I don't like the price. Uh, I'd like to see it a little cheaper. Three or four times a year, the market seems to accommodate me. And I guess the difference between me and some people is that makes me happy because <laughs> I have the courage of my convictions. And in their case, it makes them sad because they don't. Um, actually, that is, I don't actually know what you're going to say for the rest of this interview, but that is an incredible takeaway for investors new to the market and even experienced investors. Have lists ready to go and be prepared to take um, advantage of opportunities when they present themselves to you. That is a really good takeaway. So thank you very much for that. Now, before we move on to a couple of other commodity related questions, and we're also gonna to touch on China, I wanna talk a little bit more about your ranking system. Now you very generously, last time we spoke, uh, offered up your personal insight to stocks that people are holding in their portfolio, only commodity stocks. So we made it very clear, you didn't wanna rank any Teslas or banks or anything like that. Um, how does it actually work? Because you've seen a, th a few questions come through about what you're ranking these stocks against and, and what value investors can take away from this. The rankings are really uh, the cumulative knowledge of the whole Sprout organization. But I take the bow, I take the blame. Uh, I use all of the information to rank the stocks. And some of the rankings will uh, strike people as being very subjective. Uh, I try to rank companies by what I see is their quality relative to their price. It, it bears note, uh, Shay, that in a rip-roaring gold bull market, the lower quality companies will often outperform the market uh, in the market versus the higher quality companies. If you are a low-cost gold producer and the gold price goes up, you will enjoy less margin expansion than a high-cost producer would. That notwithstanding, uh, I uh, always defer to quality. 
uh, in any subset of the mining business, I prefer the high quality company over the low quality company. In the uh, sub 500 million market cap space, I'm particularly fussed about management. Uh, I want experienced management and I want their experience to be uh, in whatever prior success they enjoyed uh, relevant to the task at hand, which is to say, if someone comes to me and says, Rick, I've been a success in mining, but that success involved operating uh, a gold mine in Archean two billion year old rock in French speaking Quebec, but the task at hand is exploring rather than producing for copper gold in 15 million year old accreted terrain in Spanish speaking Peru, I don't regard uh, that management experience as particularly relevant. So I, I should say too, in a simple sense that <clears throat> my rankings are regarded by almost every analyst I know as quite harsh, not hopeful. Uh, one is best, 10 is worst. Uh, I remember awarding nine number one rankings in 35 years of ranking stocks. To get a feeling for how hard it is for me to assign a one, a one requires a company where I believe it's selling at half or less of its current liquidation value. Oh. That is it's selling for half of what their assets could be sold to a competitor for. I need to see a catalyst in place that I believe will double the stock in the 12 to 18 months time frame. I need to believe that there is a possibility, doesn't need to be a probability, but there needs to be a probability that the stock will go up tenfold in five years. Uh, I need the probability that the deposit ends up being a tier one deposit, which in a gold equivalent basis is 5 million ounces plus, able to produce half a million ounces a year. Uh, and I need manage, uh, a management team who is also first tier, but more than first tier uh, is also incented like me, which is to say they're large shareholders. Um, that's a very, very, very tough order. And the consequence of that is that I have issued uh, very few uh, ones in my career. Conversely, I've probably issued only about 20 tens in my career. A 10 is a stock that's so obviously stinky uh, that it probably is fraudulent. Uh, and what a 10 means is that if you're a speculator, uh, you should short the stock to the extent that you can acquire the bar. <laughs> uh, everything else is in between. Uh, and what you find is that my rankings sort of tend to clump currently uh, in the four to seven range. Mm -hmm. Uh, you'll recall from earlier interviews, Shay, that my belief is that uh, among, in particular, the junior mining stocks worldwide, be they in exploration or whatever, there's probably 1,500 or 2,000 of them. And I think that probably only 300 are worth speculating on at all, which suggests that the majority of the juniors in my rankings are going to fall in six, sevens, or eights. Now, just before we move on to our other questions, I just want to ask, do you happen to remember what company that made it as a one and a company that made, as, made it as a 10 for reference? Because they are two extremes. <laughs> and obviously, you've ranked a lot of them in your career. Do you remember any off the top of your head? The yeah. company was selling for 63 Canadian cents a share. It had 97 cents a share in cash in the treasury, having just raised money from basically a Chinese parastatal at $1.17 or twice market. Uh, in addition to that, you had the man that I believe is the most successful natural resource financier of my generation, Robert Friedman, truly seriously successful. And you had three world-class ore bodies, the Platte Reef, uh, Kapushi, uh, and Kamoa. Uh, and yes, they were in some challenging countries, South Africa or Congo. Uh, but the truth is I had never seen uh, that sort of uh, agglomeration of value selling at a huge discount, dump, discount to cash uh, with the person who I believe is the single best person on the planet to do what he was doing. Uh, that was one. The um, most recent 10, uh, I would prefer not to name 
for <laughs> li libel or slander reasons. <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that the uh, management team were to be charitable butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. Uh, they had no redeeming features. The uh, exploration property was one that I was personally familiar with. Uh, it had failed in three prior cycles <laughs> and was certain to fail again. And the company had spent something like $700,000 on financial public relations to jit me the stock hire. The management team, knowing that there was no particular sense in spending too much money on the property, wasn't using the increased share price to put money in the treasury, but rather using the increased share price to come off their own personal paper. And I just decided that if they were selling, I should sell some too. Uh, I just didn't happen to own any, so I was sure. <laughs> Um, okay, we're going to touch on China in just a moment, but I do want to put this out there for everybody who's listening is Rick's just mentioned Robert Friedland. Now, um, I've had the pleasure of seeing Robert talk twice now via your conferences, Rick. One was last year when we were allowed to explore the world uh, and one was this year over the virtual conference. And I encourage every commodities investor to seek out what Robert, uh, Robert has to say. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to him and his insights. So please, people, go Google him, find him on YouTube. He is fantastic or go see him in person at Rick's con uh, conference next year. All right, let's move on to China. Now, China, China's been in the headlines uh, for many reasons this year. And out of all the countries around the world, Australia's uh, economic fortunes are very much tied to what they do. So let's talk about the great reflation that's happening in China and the impact that that is having on commodity prices right now. My gut, Shay, is that there are three things that we need to talk about briefly in terms of the Chinese reflation. <clears throat> the first is troubling. Uh, China is still an export-led economy, uh, despite their efforts to grow the size of their domestic market. Their surplus comes from selling stuff to us. Uh, and to the extent that we that is Western nations, and I include both Australia and the United States in this, to the extent that we experience uh, uh, an economic slowdown, uh, either COVID related or not, there will be less export demand and hence the Chinese will have less free capital available to spend on urbanization. The second comment I have is also negative. Uh, the Chinese banking system is notoriously political and opaque. Uh, and I think some of China's economic strength is, uh, how would you say, uh, related to excess central bank liquidity, something that Americans are very familiar with. Uh, the difference, of course, is that our banking system is less political and, and extremely transparent, which is to say safer. The third thing, however, is entirely bullish. Uh, and that is that the Chinese people, and I guess this is going to sound reverse racist, but the Chinese people uh, are notoriously hardworking and notoriously thrifty. The savings rates uh, in China uh, or among Chinese people abroad are spectacular. And the urbanization of China is still continuing. Uh, we look at the trend that's been in motion for 30 years, which is to say the urbanization of China. And the Chinese authorities believe that there are still 150 million people in China that need to be urbanized, uh, brought off the farm. Uh, these people require all the things that you and I take for granted. They require transportation, they require electricity, they require housing, and all of those things are resource intensive. The topic, frankly, Shea brings up a, a broader topic, which we should mention, uh, which is incredibly bullish for commodities and incredibly bullish for Australia, which is to say the rapid increase in living standards at the bottom of the demographic pyramid. Uh, a billion and a half people on earth are extraordinarily poor. That's the bad news. The good news is in the last 30 years, they have advanced very, very, very rapidly. They all aspire to the life that you and I have. Uh, and increasingly, they're able to afford a piece of it. But there's still 1.2 billion people on the planet that don't have access to electricity. Uh, as people at the bottom of the demographic pyramid acquire the means to improve their life, the things that have the most utility to them 
are physical. They're made of stuff. You and I already have too much stuff. Uh, when we get money, uh, it goes into services or it goes into some little unpronounceable gizmo that Apple makes, it doesn't okay. use anything. But when poor people get money, uh, they buy shoes for their kids. They graduate to a bicycle or a 100cc motorcycle or uh, they put a steel roof rather than a thatch roof on their hut. All of that requires stuff. And you in Australia are perfectly placed. And this is a longer term trend. It's not something that's going to move a market next quarter. <laughs> this is a longer term trend. But it's a longer term trend that's purely an unalloyed good. I've traveled for 40 years to frontier markets in the resource business. And there's nothing that makes you happier than um, seeing a village that used to be visited literally by starvation. Uh, thriving in their sense, not thriving in a way that you and I would choose to live, but relative to the way they came up, thriving to be sure. And understand and remember again that the ascent of man at the bottom of the economic pyramid is extremely commodities intense. That's what you saw in China. You saw the urbanization of 600 million people since 1990. Uh, the impact uh, of that uh, is something that we can hopefully expect to become much more internationalized in the next 10 years. I think it's a good thing all the way around. And it's uh, particularly important for a couple of commodities that you mentioned earlier, which is copper and oil, isn't it? It is. Uh, everybody talks about the electric metals. The most important electric metal is copper. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more important to electrification than all of those rare earths that nobody can pronounce. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so it is extraordinarily important to copper. I think it's important to steel too, which is of course uh, important to Australia, but probably the best play uh, in the intermediate term is oil. Uh, despite, you know, the fact that Greta doesn't like oil and uh, things like that, uh, it's going to be with us for a fairly long time. The most recent estimates I read were that peak oil demand occurs in about 2035, mm -hmm. which is an interesting topic in and of itself, but a more interesting thing and something that's a lesson for other commodities is that when you have a commodity like oil, irrespective of whether the big thinkers like it, you and I like to use it. And if the pricing structure for the industry worldwide doesn't exceed uh, the cost of uh, production, fully loaded cost of production, the stuff becomes unavailable. Uh, right now, the International Energy Agency would suggest that the fully loaded cost to produce a barrel of oil, including you know social costs, cost of capital, all that, about 60 US dollars a barrel. So the industry makes the stuff for 60 and they sell it for 40, losing 20 bucks a barrel. They do it 90 million times a day. Now, that gets boring, and then after a while, it gets painful. And what happens is that the industry constrains their sustaining capital investments, and they constrain their uh, new project investments, and the supply of oil declines. But because oil is so necessary, when the market responds to increasing tightness, the industry can't increase supply again rapidly to meet demand. So you get the price spikes that you saw in the year 2000. And my suspicion is that the oil price either rises gradually from 40 to 60, or later it rises explosively from 40 to 80. <laughs> uh, that's just the way these markets work. Uh, now we've almost run out of time today, but if you'll just humor me one more uh, for a little uh, for one more moment, I um, would like to talk about iron ore. Now, um, you know, you mentioned the importance of steel in um, in, in the growth of China uh, earlier in the year. There was a lot of talk about the Pilbara killer coming out, and that you know Australians' fortunes were gone because China's investing heavily in Guinea. But is this really going to take over from the Pilbara? Like, are we really under threat from this mine that isn't going to even be active for another five years? Or is it really just going to fill the supply gaps for China? I don't believe that that mine's going to be active for 10 years, first of oh, all. There we go. And I, think it, I think it'll be a formidable deposit. There are actually two in West Africa that will be formidable deposits. Um, but it's important to note that Australia is, first of all, the most reliable producer of oil, oh, pardon me, of iron on the planet. It isn't merely that the Pilbara is a, 
a very high quality source of supply. It's that the mines are built, the infrastructure is established, and the operators, even the two, two smaller operators, uh, I'm talking about uh, Hancock and Fortescue, are very well run and extremely well capitalized. If you go up the quality trail to uh, Rio and BHP, uh, they're behemoth companies that do a superb job in producing iron. So what that means is that Australia will be regarded around the world as a high quality, reliable supplier. The second thing is that uh, Australia um, is an efficient producer, which is to say a very low cost producer. The an increased penetration of West African iron on the world market will, I suspect, take marginal producers, uh, Indian producers, other African producers, perhaps some Brazilian producers, and make their life more complex before uh, it will make the Pilbara complex. What I would be concerned about in the context of the uh, iron market would be uh, the possibility, I'm not going to say the probability, but the possibility of economic weakness on a global scale that would constrain for a while uh, demand for steel and hence iron. But I personally believe Australia's competitive position in the iron business is, at least in my lifetime, which I hope is long, um, without question. Wonderful, Rick. Look, um, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, have a lovely afternoon. Might I, if I'm allowed, make my rankings offer again? Please do. Uh, I, I love Agora subscribers around the world. And to encourage them to correspond with me, I, I make an uh, offer in Agora interviews. Uh, that offer is that I will rank your natural resource portfolios one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comment might have some value. And I will include, if you request it, two charts. One, the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the best visual tool to examine the anatomy of gold bull markets over the last 50 years. And the second is a 100-year commodity chart, which is a wonderful visual tool to understand the price of commodities relative to other economic assets going back a hundred years. I look forward to communicating with as many of you as feel uh, attracted by that offer. I, um, you know, as you know, I basically recommend stocks for a living. So a lot of people who will contact you will be, rec uh, you know, asking you for feedback on my stocks. And I fully encourage my subscribers to do that because you've got to remember as an investor, you can't take your information just from one source. You've got to get it from many sources if you want to be a great investor. So I really do hope people watching have taken you up on that offer or do take you up on that offer shortly. And investors need to understand that my rankings are quite harsh. Uh, <laughs> while I talk investments all the time, it's also important to note that I made all the money that I now invest by speculating. Uh, and so I don't discourage it. Just understand the risks. That's wonderful, Rick. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, everybody, we will make sure that the link to the Sprott Ranking page is below this video. And once again, Rick, thanks for enjoying me and have a lovely, lovely afternoon where you are. A pleasure, Shay. I look forward Sunday to catching sight of you in person again. I hope so too. <laughs>